Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Danger on Delmarva. My name is Rhonda Jefferson, and thank you so much for taking some time to listen today. If you're new here, welcome. I'll be your host as we explore the windy and wondrous roads of Delmarva. Now, today's episode is going to be a little bit different as we focus on some stories that have a much more positive ending than the ones that I usually cover. Looking forward to upcoming episodes. An episode that I will be publishing within the next few weeks has been a little while in the making as I've tried to gather some information with little success, basically. The case is a very old one, which harkens back to a time where not as many records were kept as diligently as they are today. Now, thankfully, there are still some resources and material that I could use. The incident, or rather more accurately, incidents, took place around 90 years ago. And of course, that means no pictures or articles would have been automatically uploaded to the internet. The topic of this case will be an extremely heavy and hard topic to hear about. Recently, someone responded to a Facebook post that I made that it would be nice to hear some good news. So looking back at episodes I've covered in the past and at ones I'll be covering in the future, I thought now was a good time to look at those stories that had happier endings. So I think it never hurts to try to infuse a little bit of humanitarianism, teamwork, and selflessness to help restore our faith in humanity sometimes. Now, there is something that defines the Delmarva Peninsula. In fact, it couldn't really be called a peninsula without it, and that's water. Now, I admit, I took our access to the water for granted when I was a child. I lived near a large river with tributaries and ponds, and a trip to the beach really wasn't this outing that we would have to plan for days and days. Into my 20s, as I'm becoming more independent, it really wouldn't be anything for me just to wake up on a day that I had off from work, decide I was going to head down to, say, Fenwick Island, Dewey Beach, any of those, just kind of ride through, see which ones might be less busy, and decide to spend the day down there. So the thought of not being so close to the ocean or to the Chesapeake Bay and all of the rivers and ponds that dot the peninsula is completely unthinkable to me. And this water is important for not only sustaining life, but sustaining the lifeblood of an area. Surrounded by water, the eastern shore and its waterways could be used for travel, for commerce throughout the nation as ships brought supplies into local ports, Plus, many people make their living by way of the water, whether it be as fishermen, watermen who harvest crabs, ferry workers, and, as the area has grown and evolved, tourism. And some of our episodes will really be looking at tourism today. Not all, but some. And I think that as residents of Delmarva, we have a very unique thought process when it comes to tourists. Tourism drives many of our local businesses and brings untold revenue to the area. And... If you do visit, you may hear locals mentioning the traffic. I try to look at it as if the traffic gets a little backed up, it gives me an opportunity to take a shortcut or a long cut in some cases through the back roads and get to see all of the nature and the fields. And I actually discovered this beautiful way home from my work um, during summer months when traffic was a little backed up. So I decided just to make a turn and I figured I... I would find my way out even if I didn't know all the roads. And I found this this commute, this drive that took me past just this beautiful pond. And it was worth the extra few minutes to just see that pond. And I would take that, that route anytime that I could, usually during the summer and spring though, because when it got really dark back there, it got really dark back there. So during those other months, I, I would stay to the main thoroughfares. So just a hint, if you are visiting, make sure that you give yourself a little bit of extra time for travel. But as with many things, even if something is wondrous, life-giving, and awe-inspiring, it can also be dangerous. So just as we need water to live, just as we've relied on water to transport the goods we need and provide food for our tables, 
sometimes it can lead to tragedy in just the blink of an eye. And while these instances are really very rare, it can still happen. So we have to be aware of our surroundings and whenever possible, avoid some of the pitfalls that can lead to the danger. But many times in these cases, especially in the events that we're going to review today, we will find that even though water has posed a danger, people still come together to help someone, even perfect strangers. And the outcome saved a life and can help breathe a spark of humanity into a world that sometimes seems like it's inhumane. So we're going to start in Ocean City, Maryland. And while this particular case is not um, tourism based, it did involve the water and just how quickly something unthinkable can happen in just a matter of moments. Now, a lot of people may have heard of Ocean City, Maryland. There are a couple of routes into Ocean City. And if you've ever looked at Ocean City on a map, it's very uniquely positioned. Um, there is the peninsula, but then there's an area that is a bay within the peninsula. So not the Chesapeake Bay, but in this case, we're looking at the Assawoman Bay. And yes, that's spelled like it sounds. And I'll leave a map um, in the description. There'll be a link to a map that shows exactly where that bay is. And the bridge that crosses over Assawoman Bay basically connects Ocean City to the mainland of Delmarva. What that means is really almost twice the coastline. So Ocean City has the Atlantic Ocean to one side and bay to the other. There's actually a couple of different bays in that area. Um, they're smaller bays, and I've actually heard the Assawoman Bay sometimes referred to as a lagoon as well. Um, that's why I'll put up the maps, but I don't want to give all of the other names of the different bays um, so that there's not as much confusion in regards to exactly where something is happening. Just last year, on May 2nd of 2021, an accident occurred on the Route 90 bridge that involved five different vehicles. Now, this at any time is a horrific scene, even if there are few to no injuries and everybody can walk away. It's still a traumatic event that nobody ever wants to be a part of. But on this day, it was a multi-vehicle accident to the point that a mass casualty event was called by first responders. And in the midst of all this, something unimaginable happened. A truck was dangling off the side of the Route 90 bridge. It had gone through the guardrail and was teetering precariously off the bridge. Now, this right now is probably stress-inducing, if you can imagine yourself or any of your loved ones in this situation. But what had occurred is an 18-month-old little girl still strapped in to her car seat fell from the truck into the bay. Fortunately, if we can call it that, the distance was about a 25-foot fall. And without hesitation, a bystander ran and jumped into the water after the baby. Now, just take in this sight and how quickly it's happening. Not only has this horrific accident happened where so many people are injured, ultimately eight people were taken to the hospital. But while this is happening and people are trying to help, there's realization that this little baby is falling from the truck into the bay. Jonathan Bauer did not hesitate. He jumped in after her and was able to gather her up safely in his arms. Now, another boat was approaching the area to help with any type of rescue or to lend assistance. So they were able to get to both Jonathan and the baby and get them into the boat. While the other seven people that were injured were taken to local hospitals, the little girl was flown to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. She was in stable condition at the time she was transported and was later released. In June, the United States Air Force Thunderbirds were having an air show in Ocean City. Now, if you're not familiar with the Thunderbirds, what they are is a flying squadron that performs at air shows and does demonstration flights. So they're very well known, even worldwide. So they really are the best of the best. So now you may be thinking, why is she bringing up the Thunderbirds after talking about a car accident? 
before their air show in Ocean City that following June, just following the accident, they chose Jonathan Bauer to be their hometown hero for the event. He was honored with his name emblazoned upon the plane that he was to fly in, which was an F-16 Fighting Falcon. He took a flight which lasted about 45 minutes. It had originated at NASA's Wallops Island, Virginia base, and that's not really that far from Ocean City. To quote what the Thunderbirds wrote regarding Bauer, quote, his selfless act shows the best America has to offer, and we're proud to have honored him with a flight today. So this man, with no thought to his own safety, jumped in to save a little girl who could not maneuver, could not get out of her seat, and he deserves every honor that he received from that heroic act. Now, specifics weren't really given regarding the toddler's parents, if they were among those taken to the hospital, if she was with someone else that day, if they were able to fly with her to Johns Hopkins. But I'm sure that to say they were relieved that someone like Bauer was around is an understatement. How selfless it was for someone to take their own life and put it at risk for another is always amazing. Bauer jumped over without knowing exactly what was in the water beneath him. Could there have been some sort of rock formation under the water? Could he really control how and where he landed? But he acted on instinct because all he could see was a child strapped into a car seat. Every second was crucial to stop her from drowning. And who knows if the boats in the area would have been able to make it to her and get her out of the water in time. So to Jonathan Bauer, the first responders on the scene, the bystanders who lent a hand both on the bridge and in the water, thank you for all that you did that day. Now we're going to look at another event that also happened in Ocean City, kind of. It actually took place 25 miles out to sea. And you might wonder, is this technically considered danger on Delmarva? Well, I think so, as it is an open area of water most associated with Delmarva. So I do believe it belongs there. In July of 2012, three people went out on a boat and never anticipated their day ending as it did. At some point during their trip, an anchor damaged the hull. Now, because of this, the boat began to take on water. And it was really more water than the passengers um, could handle. Now, I could not find in the article if there was already an existing pump on the boat that just wasn't able to handle the amount of water or if they did not have one. But they did put out an urgent call um, to the Coast Guard. This boat was one that was called the last one. The Coast Guard station in Hampton Roads, Virginia, were the ones that received the call, and they in turn put out an urgent broadcast and a helicopter came from the Coast Guard's air station in Atlantic City, New Jersey. There was also a motor lifeboat crew that was dispatched from Ocean City. Now, at this time, the call was also heard by the crew members of a fishing boat called the Little Angler. Now, this boat was a 38-foot fishing boat. They diverted from where they were to help assist in the rescue of the people on this boat. Um, the People on the last one, remember that's the name of the boat, um, had made their urgent call at approximately 1215. The little angler had made its way to the boat by 1230 p.m. So that was about as close as immediate as you can get on the water. When they got on scene, the little angler passed a pump to the damaged boat. It was called a dewatering pump, and what this did is it helped pump water out of the boat as it was taking on the water through the damaged hull. And now might be a good time to discuss something called a duty to render assistance. And what this does is require civilian boats to respond when there's been a distress call. And they then provide assistance to those who are in danger um, in the damaged or sinking vessel. So... This is actually handled at the state level. So the state where the boat is registered is the state that is supposed to monitor this regulation. Just a side note, I kind of wonder how hard that is to actually track because if people are in different frequencies or if they have a radio in a certain room of the boat and they're above deck, then 
you know, there's a possibility that they wouldn't hear it, not that they're ignoring the call, just that they didn't hear the call to assist other voters. There is also a caveat to that, of course, that if by responding to the distress call that they would put the boat or the people aboard the boat in danger, then they are not required to render assistance. So, for example, which we will see in a later event, if getting to the people requires a boat to actually, say, bump up against rocks um, or somehow be damaged, then you're not going to risk your boat or any people on board that boat to try to render that assistance. So while it is considered a duty of all mariners, it, depending on the boat, it can take a lot to turn it around. Um, also, the thought of taking it off course can have a negative impact on any potential income that that boat may have, you know, especially if it's a fishing boat, then that could impact the haul or the catch that they have that day therefore decreasing their income. But just me, I, I really think most mariners would respond in a time where anybody is in danger. Of course, I am not a professional, professional fisherman, but I have known some. And just in my opinion from those that I have known, I think any of them would go to the rescue in a heartbeat, even if it wasn't a requirement. They know that in any given second, something can change that puts their ship, and more importantly, the people aboard the ship in danger. It feels like an understanding, almost, that they do this not even with the hopes of the favor being returned sometime later. They do this with a true desire to help others. And in this case, just with the speed that the little angler was able to get to the last one and render aid was amazing. You know, who knows how much time the people could have you know, survived upon the boat. So the Coast Guard agreed and they were very, very happy with the assistance that the little angler provided. Lieutenant Joseph Hill said, and I quote, the crew of the Good Samaritan boat made this one of the easiest cases I've worked. They lent their hand pump to the sinking vessel, updated position reports, and popped an emergency smoke signal, which allowed us to locate the sinking vessel quickly and provide immediate assistance. If they had not been there, we could have been searching a large area. The Coast Guard began to arrive at the last one at around 1 p.m. That's when a helicopter arrived and then also deployed a, another dewatering pump and also a rescue swimmer to go aboard the last one and assist in the, watering, the dewatering of the boat. At this point, it did not mention if the little angler was still there. At one point in the report, it did say that the little angler stayed until assistance arrived. So just based on that wording, it seems as though the little angler did leave after making sure that the last one was in a good position and good hands with the Coast Guard. So... Um, the Coast Guard also arrived at 140. That was when a boat um, arrived and a member of the crew traded places with the res rescue swimmer that had been helping with the dewatering. The boat then was able to make its way back to Ocean City, Maryland, with the assistance of the dewatering pump and the Coast Guard member that was on board their boat. So that, in essence, served to not only save the people, but also get the boat um, back to the shore. Now, these next two stories actually take place in Virginia, and they can show the importance of making sure you have the right equipment and being prepared when you do go out to the water. Both of these take place off Chincoteague, and the first one occurred in September of 2021, so just last year, and it was actually on September 1st. What happened is severe weather started to settle around the area of Chincoteague, causing a small boat to go aground, and that was in the Chincoteague Inlet. There were three people aboard this boat. The Coast Guard received a call at around 2.22 p.m. So just like we've seen in the previous case, the Coast Guard did put out an urgent call over the radio. Two crews were dispatched from what's called Sector Virginia. Um, one of them was actually designed for shallow water rescue. Now, since it had gone aground, then that shows that, yes, this was shallow water, and that, had, that really adds a whole new complexity to the rescue. 
in addition to the boats that were sent, a Jayhawk helicopter was sent from the air station Elizabeth. And now this water rescue, like I mentioned before, will be a little more difficult than some others because of them being in shallow water. So this really required the rescuers to face these obstacles with knowledge, patience, and cooperation. The water was still choppy because of the storm. And you know, after realizing that the rescue could not be affected from the actual water, the helicopter was able to lower a line to hoist the boaters up and take them to Wallops Island, Virginia. Now, reading about this, I can't imagine how scared everyone must have been. The stranded boaters' lives were literally on the line. Members of the rescue team, which coordinated with a few different Coast Guard stations, were able to recognize early that the rescue by boat was not an option, allowing for the difficult rescue to take place while the boat was still together instead of fruitlessly trying to access the boaters by water. Thankfully, there were no serious injuries. According to Chief Petty Officer Ross Comstack, while we were fortunate that the boat stayed together long enough to effect the rescue, the distressed mariners were prepared with life jackets, which most certainly helped the rescue swimmer to get them from the boat to the helicopter safely. So just kind of imagine seeing this, that just in the um, Chincoteague Inlet, you have a helicopter that is pulling people up from a boat that's been grounded with the water just kind of splashing and, you know, rising up with waves all around them. And, you know, what I mentioned earlier about, you know, the importance of quickly realizing that the water rescue was not really a viable option. There was concern about the boat staying together because it was being bashed against, you know, anything that was around it. And there was the possibility that the boat could have actually fallen apart with the boater still in there. So while there is not mention of, you know, the boaters' awareness that a storm might have been possible, and just kind of a hint, there are some times of, year, of the year around here when it seems like a storm is always possible. But just a tip is to make sure that you check the weather when you're making your plans, but then to check it again before you go out. If you look at the weather forecast four or five hours before you leave, you won't know if something has possibly changed unless you check it immediately before you go out. Things can always change quickly. And as Chief Petty Officer Comstack said, life jackets, definitely life jackets. Now staying in the Chincoteague area, we're going from a rescue of three people to a rescue of six people. This happened actually 60 miles east of Chincoteague, Virginia. And in this case, there was also a Good Samaritan that helped out as well. Of those six people, thankfully, there were no injuries reported. However, the 34-foot boat was not viable anymore. It was considered unrecoverable. There was a distress signal that was sent through a VHF channel from the captain of a boat called Not Stressen. And not is spelled K-N-O-T, kind of a play on, you know, the sailor's knots and things like that. Um, the captain of the vessel said that there was flooding in the engine room, which, you know, it, that can be a really bad sign. Let's just face it. The determination was made by those on board that they needed to get into the life draft. Now, again, going back to scary situations, I wasn't there at the time, but anytime you're going from this very large ship, comparatively into a life raft, it's got to be a harrowing experience, um, something that you would never ever dream of going through, but it is a possibility. There were two boats that were sent to assist the not stressing. The first was a Coast Guard cutter named Sailfish. This was an 87-foot patrol boat. Now, it's a patrol boat, so it was out on the water. It was actually diverted to go back um, to try to assist the vessel. There was also a 47-foot motor lifeboat. That one came from the Coast Guard station in Chincoteague. Now, as you've come to know that whenever this happens, there is an urgent call put out to all other boaters. And at this time, a boat that was 65 foot long, it was a fishing boat, um, and it was named the Fishbone, heard the call and went to assist 
the knot stressin. The fishbone actually made it there for any of the Coast Guard boats. So this emphasizes the importance of that communication and cooperation between civilian boats because sometimes they are closer to the vessel in distress. So the fishbone was able to rescue all of the people off the boat, or off the life raft, I should say. So again, we have people who, in this case, it is their livelihood, and they diverted to go assist another boat. So I find that always just very uplifting that even though it you know, really was something that could affect um, the people on the fishbone. They, you know, selflessly went out and helped others. So that's really heartwarming and uplifting that, you know, they did turn around and do that. So as far as the equipment that those aboard the not stressing had, um, they had a VHF radio. They also had a life draft, which, as we just heard, was necessary in order to help save those on board and they all had life jackets and personal locator beacons so that in itself shows that the people on this vessel were very prepared um i know with personal locator beacons you know i've heard about them as far as when people go hiking um when they go camping to try to have something like that on hand because some of those will work outside of you know, cell phone range. So that allows rescuers to find you faster. So this boat was very fully equipped and that led to a rescue with no injuries where it could have turned out so, so tragic. Now, Sarah Pulliam, who was the Sector Virginia Command Center Chief, um, said this, and I quote, there are so many factors that made this case a success. We have a command center staffed by true professionals who were able to coordinate the rescue of these individuals, and there are amazing people out on the water who do not hesitate when they hear lives are in danger. These mariners were also well prepared in terms of having the right safety equipment on board and knowing how to use it. Now, I'm just going to interject a little bit here, too. Um, not only have there been advances in technology to allow things such as the personal locator beacon, but with every accident that has happened in the past, that technology can advance by learning what works and what does not work. Um, people also learn you know, what to do in certain situations when an accident occurs. So with each accident comes a lesson to be learned and while unfortunately we do a lot of times focus on those lessons being negative, in the, these cases, the lessons are actually positive in that the boaters were equipped and had the right gear to help really assist in their own rescue. Now I have two more stories left, one on the water and one on land. So I hope you'll indulge me with the last story that happens on the water, as it happened just a little bit outside of Delmarva, but it is a personal story, and it is probably a pretty good idea not to do what I did. Going back again to when I was in my 20s, I would sometimes take vacations down into the Jamestown, Virginia Beach area. Now, one year there was the anticipation when I left that a hurricane might be coming up and through the area. So going there, I plotted out my days, looked at the weather, and I had really wanted to take kind of this tour cruise on the James River, but I was on a budget. You know, I was there visiting by myself, so the cost of the room was totally mine, everything. So part of the decision of which tour to take was impacted by how much it costs. So after reviewing everything, I found one that fit both my financial needs as well as um, being scheduled before the hurricane hit. It was scheduled actually the day before. So being young and impetuous, I didn't think anything could ever happen. Um, back then, I was, I don't want to say fearless, but at the same time, you know, I I was gaining my independence, I'll just say. So I went, got on the boat, 
the boat was not the greatest boat in the world, but at the same time, the employees were really, really nice. You could tell that they loved what they did. So, you know, if there wasn't the fact that a hurricane was going to be coming through the area, I, you know, probably would have really, really enjoyed the cruise. And I did up until a certain point. So as we're heading out, um, yeah, the water starts to get very, very choppy. At the beginning of the tour, you know, the, um, I'll just call him the MC, um, had said or mentioned about the weather that the um, hurricane was not expected until the following day, but sometimes they would get winds, um, you know, some of the water may be affected, but, you know, the actual storm was not anticipated until the following day. It started to sprinkle rain a little bit, but still no major issues. The MC told us that you know, right now everything looked fine, but did start to prepare us that at some point we may need to turn around. And eventually that point did come. And as I've mentioned before, um, things could change very, very quickly. And in fact, it did. So we turned around. The water was, at this point, not a little choppy, not a lot choppy, but extremely choppy. Now, during this tour near the beginning, he had also mentioned how the docks around um, the river were actually floating docks. So they moved up and down with the waves. The reason this was is during a previous hurricane, the, um, the docks were destroyed, so they were replaced with these floating docks. And, you know, we're still on the boat, we're heading back, things are just getting worse and worse and worse. Once we get up to one of the docks. It actually, with the worst timing in the world, it comes up with one of the waves. It hits the, the stairs on the boat and something breaks. So we're literally standing there. And again, very nice people, not the greatest boat. We kind of had to hop from the boat onto the floating dock without having use of all of the steps. So remember how I said, I wouldn't quite call myself fearless, but you know, I was gaining my independence. I did not want my independence at that point. I wanted someone to help me and help me get off the dock. Um, I will tell you that once we hit the solid dock, because the floating dock extended into um, further into the water, and then at some point it became a, you know, um, a fixed dock. I have never been so happy in my life to put my feet down on wood that did not move. And I guess probably nobody was really in danger, but at the same time, I kind of berated myself. I'm like, how could you do that? You knew a hurricane was coming. I am aware of the strength of hurricanes, but yes, I made a foolish decision that day. But again, going back to the employees on the boat, they were all just very calm. They were very assuring. You know, there was a small child who was afraid and they did their best to comfort her. I mean, you know, you could say it's their job, but we hear of so many cases sometimes where, you know, when it comes to something like that, people don't always, you know, rise to the occasion. But, you know, these um, these sailors did and made sure everybody really felt as comfortable as possible. I can't say comfortable, but as possible um, during this whole thing. So as a tip, even if the weather says a hurricane is coming the next day, don't get on the water. You never know how strong those winds and those currents and I guess I should say waves will be <laughs> the day before. So lesson learned. They did actually say at the end, if we wanted to come back and take a cruise after the hurricane had passed, it would of course be at no charge. But I don't really think anybody took them up on that offer. After that, it was kind of enough, um, you know, for the vacation. And I know I definitely did not take them up on the offer. I remember passing by as you know, he was saying that and I walked by um, the MC and I was just shaking my head no as I was going by. <laughs> so that's my story. Um, again, a little bit outside of Delmarva, but something that someone who lives near water has seen hurricanes should have known better. And we were all very lucky, you know, to have had, um, you know, such professional employees 
who are able to take care and handle things. And that even though the actual forecast said one thing, we were most definitely getting harder waves and rain than had been forecasted. So we are now at our last story that takes place in Newark, Delaware. And I knew, even though this took place on land, that I wanted to include it because I saw the body cam footage and it was just such a harrowing experience um, you know, for the person who was trapped and I'm sure for the Good Samaritan who had called the police or called for um, emergency services. What happened is in Newark, a 70-year-old woman had forgotten to put her car in park. So as she exited, the car did roll and it trapped her. Um, her left arm and leg, um, they were trapped under a tire and her right leg was actually in the wheel well. So she's trapped under the car and fortunately, um, her neighbor, neighbor Kyle Stant, saw this and at first came over and tried to get the car um, off her by using a jack, but it was too short. He was, or he did reach out to emergency services and police officers from the Delaware State Police showed up and with all of the people on scene, the police officers, the um, Good Samaritan, who was the neighbor Kyle, were able to lift the car off of the victim. So I can cannot even imagine the adrenaline, the fear um, that was going on at that time. Now, Kyle said in an interview that, you know, when he was there with her, she said to him, Kyle, please help me. Don't leave me. He then said that his response was, I am not going to leave you. We are going to get through this. We are going to get you out. So, you know, it, in an instant, things changed as far as the car rolling over um, the woman. Also, as soon as the police got there, um, if you see the video, I will link it into the description of the podcast episode. It was very, very quick from the body cam footage. You know, it was a sense of urgency. They knew that they needed to get her out from underneath the vehicle. And they did it with an urgency and with the assistance of the neighbor. So this just shows the cooperation that in order to rescue this woman, that you know, people who may have never even met each other work together to help save her. And I'm so glad that even beyond just having the Good Samaritan there to help get the car off her, that it sounds like it was somebody that she knew. And, you know, I'm so glad he was there to comfort her. And also, I know he had to go through a lot, too. Once the adrenaline wore off, you know, probably the realization that, you know, while he was holding her hand, you know, who knows what could have happened? Could shock have set in? Could she have had a heart attack or the car shifted and hurt her even more? But he stayed there through the whole thing and, you know, summoned help to make sure that she got through it like he promised. Now, she was treated at a local hospital and survived. And as far as the role that Kyle played um, in the day's events, Mark Logeman, um, he is the chief of the Newcastle County Emergency Medical Services, said of Kyle Stant, the quick thinking and physical actions of the bystander and the officers from the Division of Police played a major role in this patient being protected from further injury and possibly death. And again, that's just such. It's a big responsibility to hold in your hands and, you know, just so glad that she had someone there that she knew when this was going on and he was able to comfort her. So this is where I'll end today's episode. Um, I know it's a little bit different than our normal format, but, you know, some days, some weeks, some years, um, we need a little bit more of a happy ending. And while, of course, we wish none of these accidents had ever happened, when they did, there were people around, both professionally trained and those willing to take a risk, whether it be risking their lives, risking their vessel, to help another person. And 
in a day and age where sometimes you look at the news and all you hear and see is, you know, negative, negative, negative. Sometimes we kind of need that infusion of positive. And I hope that this episode does it um, at least for the next few days, if, you know, from when you listen to this, hopefully longer. But I know myself, I, I kind of needed it too. I've had some rough few days and just, you know, hearing and seeing what these volunteers, basically these civilians who stepped into these roles did for others that they had never met, just really warms my heart. And, you know, it also makes you appreciate each moment you have with your loved ones. So I hope everybody did enjoy this. And, you know, like I said, within the next few episodes or the next couple of episodes, I'm going to try to make it the next episode. It's going to be a pretty heavy topic. Um, probably something that, you know, some people would like to forget had ever happened, but at the same time, we need to remember. So I will talk to you soon. Everybody have a great couple of weeks and all my contact information is in the description of the episode in case you want to send any suggestions or stories. Um, also, I know I don't bring this up often, but if you do, um, you know, if you do have a podcast app where you can rate or leave comments, that's always helpful as far as promoting the podcast, meaning it's easier for people to find if they're searching certain keywords, you know, so subscribe. Um, also, all of those things help the podcast continue to grow. And I really appreciate over the past couple of weeks, you know, it looks as though that there have been some more listeners tuning in. So I really appreciate that as well. Um, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to listen to these stories and, you know, remembering the people involved, those who you know, were the heroes, you know, especially in today's episodes. So again, I will talk to you later and have a good one, everybody. Bye.